I want to share a little Torah about benching, about benching. So when I say the word benching in a Jewish context, and I know you might think I'm talking about my usual workouts, but I'll spare you that is not where I'm going. Uh, but I appreciate those who might have associated that with me. Uh, benching. What is benching? Blessing. But when we use the word benching in a Jewish space, we're not just talking about any blessing. We're talking about, and, and sometimes we refer about blessing candles, but really what we're talking about is what? What blessing? The birkat. The birkat hamazon, right? Which is the birkat, the blessing of the mazon, the meal. So what I want to ask before we look into this week's parasha is what is the purpose of saying the birkat hamazon? What is the purpose of saying the grace after meals. And while you're thinking, I'll just frame to you what I'm talking about. At a, at a Jewish meal, okay, uh, towards the end, uh, you might uh, hear someone uh, might hand out the, the blessings, and it's called a bencher, right, because it's a book that contains the blessings. And then they would say, Rabotai Nebarach, right, everyone was drunk, he shem, Adonai Nebarach, which really means, you know, let us bless, praise God's name. And then everyone says, we praise God's name. And then there is uh, quite a long collection of blessings that follow that, that are often sung. Or you might be in a place where they're sort of mumbled or murmured along, depending on individual customs. But now that you have a sort of a sense of what takes place, what is the purpose of the Birkat Amazon? What is the purpose of the grace after meals? Lauren. Gratitude, yeah, 100%. Right? We give gratitude for the meal that we just received. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Great. What else? I think it's actually a mitzvah daraita. The thing which is in the Torah, after the Holy Spirit, the Yachalta, the Shabbat, the Eid of the Sanctified, and the Ubei Lacha, So we're going to get into more of that, but I'll just start with the first thing you shared, which is it's Doraita, it's a mitzvah, right? I'm doing a mitzvah. The Torah tells me after I eat, I should, I should bless, so I'm following a mitzvah, expressing gratitude, following a command. Tom. Yes, yes, that is actually one of the unique contributions, right, to the Jewish mindset, right, uh, which is that we are, are the, the Torah commands us to bless afterwards, right? Hinting that when it would be easiest not to express gratitude because we're full and we're done, that is precisely the time to um, when, when we should be expressing the deepest amount of, of gratitude. Great. By the way, it's very interesting. We often say, um, when there's blessings, we say before meals. And if you study the Talmud, you'll see that it is much uh, more uh, of harder work for the rabbis to explain why we should say a blessing beforehand than it is after. After they're going to, they share the verse that we're going to read in a little bit, right? Uh, and it shows, oh, the Torah says this, therefore we say blessing afterward. But to explain why we would bless beforehand, there's this long, you know, uh, back and forth about, you know, what does it mean to, uh, to sanctify and things like that. And finally, there's a conclusion that we should say blessings beforehand. But thank you, Tom, for highlighting that one of the things that's unique about the Jewish people is that we command blessing at a time when it's less likely to express gratitude. Sorry, Hedy, I saw your hand up. Beautiful, beautiful. That, I think, is where the rabbis took this command. Um, this command in the Torah, which, we're gonna, which we can read, uh, read now, on page 1041, it is chapter 8, verse 10. Ve'achalta v'savata uve'rachta et Adonai Elohecha al ha'aretz ha'tova asher natalach. When you have eaten your full, 
Give thanks to the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. And if you heard a lot of ta-ta-ta, that is Hebrew for saying this is a command for you individually. And if I'm just reading this verse without any sense of, you know, modern Jewish practice, I would think that what it's telling me to do is to have a moment of silent reflection. Hedy is accurately reflecting a big part of the Jewish experience. And it's not just the Jewish religious experience, but all you have to do is go to Jewish summer camps of all different types of denominations. And you will see that Birkat HaMazon, the singing, the community building that is associated with uh, this blessing um, are all linked to uh, Birkat HaMazon. This is from, I believe, the rabbis who saw uh, a, uh, a need for there to be a time for community to be built around meals. And one of the aspects of Birkat HaMazon is that it is a tool to create community, a tool to create belonging. And Hedy, by the way, and I'm leading into Hedy's comments, but it's also time, it's, it's specifically, by the way, for Jewish community. Birkat HaMazon is a time to highlight Jewish belonging. Okay, good. Uh, there's one other thing that's a big part of uh, benching that we, that, that, uh, Diana referenced a little bit but it's a small, important, subtle theme. Yes? I love that part. That is a modern, uh, uh, in, uh, I'll say modern, relative, a thousand years uh, um, <laughs> addition to Birkat HaMazon. And I, what a wonderful, wonderful minhag, those of you that have been at a meal where uh, instead of just seeing a verse that was added, which is, you know, may God bless everyone, right? Um, there actually is um, a custom of saying, I'm going to bless Tom and Andrew and Noah, every single person. Um, it's, it's a beautiful custom of, that stems from that one additional line. Really nice. There's another big theme of Birkat HaMazon. I'm, I'm glad I'm not seeing a lot of hands. Because it, it's there, but we really don't link the two, I think, too often. And it's Zionism, right? This is a command that is designed for us to express gratitude for what we experience in the land of Israel. This is a very Zionist mitzvah, a very Zionist ritual. And yes, we love that it's such a beautiful idea of expressing gratitude. And we're going to come back to that. But when you look at how the Birkat zone is written, it leads us to a place of the story of Israel and not so much being a global citizen and being thankful for the rains in their time, of not wasting. Birkat, the Birkat zone has a much more uh, particularistic pathway which is to bring us together in the story of Israel. And we could see in this verse, you should express gratitude. So you have gratitude, but you also have because you have eaten from the good land. Adding a theological piece there. Not just any land, but this is a land that you were given by God. So the first part I wanted to see everyone to see in Birkat Zone is that Birkat Zone is, is a Jewish community building tool, right? And it's a, you know if you've been a part of Birkat Zone, you have that sense of action um, with the Jewish community uh, because you've gone through that pathway. The next piece is it's a it is a blessing about Israel. Now what am I talking about? You're welcome to follow along, but I'll walk you through this anyways. On page 87 in our prayer books, I know I'm asking everyone to get a lot of prayer books open. The rabbis take this command and they create four blessings. Okay? Um, the first blessing is, Baruch atah Adonai, Hazan et hakol, right? Uh, bless you, Lord our God, right? The creator of all. And they actually add a beautiful midrash. And they say that the author 
of this blessing was actually um, Adam. Because when the world was created, right, Adam took a moment and said, wow, God, you've created everything. And what I want us to see is that you would think that if this is a blessing about gratitude, that the Birkat Mazan would stop here. I've covered everything. God, you create all. I'm, whoop, I'm done. But no, Birkat Mazan continues with the second blessing. Baruch Ata Adonai Al Ha'aretz Ve'al Ha'mazon. So now we have a blessing that, according to Rabbinic Midrash, was written by Joshua, and it's a blessing that says that that uh, we 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 thank God on the land and on the mazon, the the produce of the land, the food that is gleaned from the land. And one way of understanding this is that um, this comes from a time when now. We weren't completely reliant on God, but we had to uh, establish a presence in the land of Israel um, with a partnership in God. Right? We weren't going to rely on manna, but no, we were going to become farmers. We were going to live off this beautiful land. We had to maintain it. God was going to provide the water. We were going to make sure that the land was, uh, was, was, you know, was, was, pr was productive. You could even read the second blessing and be like, well, maybe it's a much more universal message. Maybe, you know, we're talking about partnership between human beings and God. It could be that we're talking about um, this idea that we live in partnership with God over the entire world. Fair enough. But the Birkat Hamazon does not end here. It goes to, I'm on page 90 if you're following, Uvene Yerushalayim, Ira Kodesh Miravi Amenu, Baruch Atadonai, Bone, Berachama, Yerushalayim, Amen. Rabbis say that this blessing was attributed to King David. And if you're listening along, you hear the Hebrew word Yerushalayim. This is a blessing thanking God for the establishment of the city of Jerusalem, which is the capital of the Jewish people, of the state of Israel, right? Designed here to be the capital of the Jewish people. This clearly links us to the land of Israel and the idea that the Jewish people have a link to the land of Israel. And then you would think, okay, maybe we should stop here. Okay, make good point. We, let's have a presence land of Israel. And we got one last blessing on page 91. <laughs> Do you hear that tiv, tiv, tiv? You're hearing tov, tov, tov. Good, good, good. And it is a request that God will restore goodness to the world. And they attribute this blessing to Rabbi Akiva, who witnessed not only the, the destruction, well, it wasn't, he lived at a time when the temple was destroyed, but even in an attempt to rebuild the temple, Rabbi Akiva himself lost his life. It's a story of tragedy. So I just want us to see that a blessing that could really suffice with an expression of gratitude that we, we appreciate God creating the world becomes extremely particularistic. And I think there is something really redemptive about that in that when we are dispersed through all of our multiple activities or <laughs> throughout the, the four corners of the world, there is a ritual during a common human experience of eating that brings the Jewish people together, that restores us with our, one of our central stories, the link of the Jewish people at the land of Israel. Now in this day and age, I gotta add one more blessing and challenge that uh, the Birkat Abazon gives us. Because, as we all know, there are multiple ways of connecting and understanding the land of Israel. And many of these narratives of Israel um, do not complement each other, but they are at odds. And I'm referring to, um, I mean, actually there's many, I'm gonna highlight two. One, is by understanding that Birkat Mazon is talking about if we live a life of faith and mitzvot, then we are able to live in the land of Israel, which is a gift. And then if we stop following the mitzvot, then we lose um, the land of Israel and we enter into diaspora. 
It is a way of linking religious practice and faith to the land of Israel. It's another way of understanding Birkat Hamazon, and you sort of get a little bit of a flavor of it when, with the exception of Rabbi Akiva, but you can even squeeze him, you have four relatively non-religious leaders that are a part of this. Moses is not in one of the authors of Birkat Hamazon, which is, which is very interesting. And there's a way of understanding Birkat Hamazon to talk about the journey of the Jewish people. We enter, humanity entered into this world. A group of humanity saw that there was a way, right, of living in balance and harmony with God, expressing various values, mitzvot in this world, and the world turned our back on these people. And therefore, we needed a homeland where we could live and stand as a people until one of the larger powers of the world conquered that land, and we were left in diaspora with only a hope that things will get better in the future. It's a way of seeing Birkat Hamazon as being a narrative of Jewish peoplehood, not even directly linked to God. It tells a story of how we have to look after ourselves and maintain ourselves and stay together against some of the challenging tides of the world that we go up against. So we have two narratives that Birkat Hamazon can bring to our attention. And in a day and age where perhaps sometimes we don't like to step out of our own narratives, maybe there's something to be gained not just by separating ourselves off from the world and being a part of the Jewish people, but in singing the Birkat Hamazon in a way that allows us to learn from one another and compare and contrast our different narratives so we can have a deeper understanding of the land of Israel. And even if we don't win that discussion, maybe most importantly, we can grow from that discussion and then fulfill the original command set forth in this Torah portion of having a deep sense of gratitude for the gift of the land of Israel. Shabbat Shalom.